In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. From the very beginning of time, man has partaken in some form of religion. But unfortunately, from not long after the beginning of the world, man has also distorted his religion before the Almighty God. Man is desired to throw in his own ideas, his think-sos, and his opinions, and very often has, because of this, tainted his religion before God. Even today, we live in the midst of a vast amount of false and impure religion. And in the midst of this great paganism, and in the midst of all the false doctrine that we see all around us, we might ask ourselves from time to time if it's even possible for us to have pure religion. Well, it is possible. It is most definitely possible, but only on one condition. And that is that we go to the source of religion, and that is God and God alone. Only through the word of God can we find what true and pure religion really is. Anything aside from his word is man's ideas, and it's man's creation, and it's vain, and it's useless religion. And so today, we're going to begin a short series based right here in the book of James, chapter 1, where James teaches us, about pure and undefiled religion. I hope that this series will help each and every one of us. I hope it reaffirms our faith. I hope that it shows us what we must be doing. And I hope that we'll look at the words of God that were written through James's pen and we'll compare our lives and our religion to make sure that we today are partaking in pure and undefiled religion. Today we're going to start really where James starts. And that is that to partake in pure religion, to partake in true religion, we must be hearers and doers of the Word of God. You know, to follow the will of God, you have to know the Word of God. And to know the Word of God, you have to hear the Word of God. Paul said to the Romans in Romans 10, verse 14 and also 17, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing the Word of God is an absolute vital step in obtaining salvation and partaking in pure and undefiled religion. However, hearing the Word alone does absolutely no good. This might seem oversimplified, too simple really to even need to say, too simple to teach on, but how many have been lost because they heard the Word but did nothing about it? In Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 14, we have a parable of a sower, and we have Christ explaining such a parable. And what you'll notice there in Acts or in Luke 8, verses 11 through 14, is that all of the various types of soils have something in common. They heard the word of God. They heard the truth of the gospel preached to them. And yet, only one type of soil was the soil that represented those that are saved. You see, there were those that didn't do anything, or there were those that did something with what they heard, but only for a short time. There are those that are on the rock, it says, that when they hear, they receive the word with joy, but they have no root, and they believe only for a while, and in a time of temptation, they fall away. There were those such as the soil of the thorns, who they heard, but they were choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and thus they actually brought no fruit to maturity. All of these heard, sometimes even with joy they heard the word of God, and yet they did nothing about it. We also are given the example of Agrippa and Felix. In Acts chapter 24, verse 24 through 25, we're told that Paul preached before the governor 
Felix. In fact, he preached, we're told, about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. And he did such a wonderful job, such a magnificent job, that even this uh, evil, immoral man, Felix, was afraid. He heard about righteousness and self-control, and he heard about judgment, and he knew he was guilty. He knew that he needed to respond. He heard the word. He heard the word from one of the greatest preachers, if not the greatest preacher, that has ever lived. And yet, what was his response? It was to tell Paul, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Felix heard the word as well as anyone has ever heard it. And yet, it didn't save him. Also, there is Agrippa, who when Paul was preaching to Agrippa, there came to a point where Agrippa said, Paul, you almost persuade me to become a, a, a Christian. Agrippa heard. Agrippa heard again from the, one of the greatest preachers of all time, and he heard to such a degree that he almost did something about it. But he did nothing. Are these examples fitting descriptions of your life? Have you heard the word of God taught in its simplicity and in its truth? and yet not obeyed it? Are you like Felix and you're waiting for a better time? Or are you like Agrippa and you're almost to the point of following what you've heard? Why are you content with merely hearing the word of God? Hearing alone will not save your soul from hell. Hearing alone will not grant you admittance through heaven's gates. How wonderful it would be if all we had to do was hear the word. We could save a lot of people if all we had to do was preach to them so that they heard. But we know that hearing alone is not sufficient for salvation. This does not just apply to those who have not obeyed the gospel. This applies to those of us who have as well. Perhaps you've obeyed the word of God in part, but you're not fully following it like you know you should. Perhaps there's sin in your life. Perhaps you know that the word of God teaches against some lifestyle you're living, but you do nothing to change. Now, if that's the situation, even though you may have been baptized sometime in the past, you are exactly like Felix and Agrippa and all the others who have ever heard the word of God and not obeyed it. For example, Luke 13 and 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's a very well-known verse. We hear it, we read it, we teach on it very often. But do we follow it? Do we apply it? Do we actually repent, actually change, actually live a different life without sin? Or do we hear that and do nothing about it? Far too many people feel justified coming to church once or twice, or if they're good Christians, they think three times a week, and simply hearing the Word of God. And I fear that far too many people will fill a pew their entire lives hearing the Word of God every time over and over again, only to lift up their eyes in a devil's hell because they never did anything with what they heard. Now, the situation of an individual who is merely a hearer of the word alone is a very sad and a very deplorable. James paints that picture for us in verses 23 through 25 of James chapter 1. James gives us the example, and the example is an individual that looks at themselves in a mirror. Now, all of us understand the purpose of a mirror. All of us have probably looked in a mirror this very day. And looking into a mirror is something that we do, understanding full well that we might not like exactly what we see. We look in a mirror knowing that it might tell us there are flaws. But the reason we look it's not because we enjoy the flaws, but because we want to know what they are so that we can correct them. If I look at the mirror, I might realize that the hair's not combed as well as it should be. Maybe the, the part's not straight. Maybe my tie's askew. Maybe there's a stain on my shirt that I hadn't seen before. I don't like any of those things, but I need to see them. I need to know about them so that I can correct them. But what if I look in the mirror and I see the crooked tie and the stained shirt and other things that are amiss, and I see them and I recognize them and I know them, but I don't do anything about it. Has anything changed? Well, of course not. The tie is still crooked. The stain is still on the shirt. The hair is not combed right. Why? Because I didn't do anything. Just seeing, just knowing, just hearing isn't enough. How foolish we would be to walk away from a mirror having seen obvious flaws in our appearance only to do nothing about it. 
But that's exactly what we do when we hear the word of God and do nothing. You know, the idea from James is not just that a man sees his blemishes and does nothing, but he sees those things and he intends to fix them. He plans on fixing them. His intentions are to correct the, the errors that he sees. And yet when he steps away from the mirror with great intentions, he forgets what he saw and he goes on and does nothing. How often do we do the very same thing in our lives spiritually? How often do we have the greatest intentions, yet we don't act on them? How many times do we sit and hear a gospel sermon or read the word of God and we see the faults that are in our lives? How often do we, when looking into the Bible, this mirror for the soul, do we see our flaws and our sins and we intend to do something about it? We see our error. We know it needs fixed and we intend to change. We intend to obey the gospel. We intend to repent of our sins. We plan on quitting our lives of immorality. We're going to leave behind our drinking. We're going to stop our stealing. We're going to quit lying. We intend to live better. We're going to read our Bibles more. We're going to tell others about Christ. We're going to come to church more often. We're going to work harder. And we are filled with the greatest of intentions. And as the sermon ends, and the preaching stops, and the book is closed, we walk away from the mirror, we forget what we saw, and we do nothing. George Bernard Shaw once said, Hell is paved with good intentions. Aldous Huxley added to that, Hell isn't merely paved with good intentions, it is walled and roofed with them. One of the scary things about good intentions is the more we allow our good intentions to rule our lives, the less likely we are to do what it is we intend to do. Each time we read our Bibles and see what it is we ought to do and intend to do it but don't, we make it that much harder on ourselves to actually implement the change we know is needed. Each time we listen to a gospel sermon and intend to put what we've heard into practice, but forget those things as soon as we step out the door, we grow further and further from doing God's will and closer and closer to the gates of hell. As one individual once said, as an alcoholic constantly requires stronger and stronger drinks, so the one who has fallen under the spell of good intentions and smooth sounding declaration constantly requires more and more good intentions and so he keeps himself from seeing that he is actually walking backwards. The longer we go without doing, the more the intentions build up within us, blinding us ever more from what we see in the mirror of God's perfect law of liberty. Far too many of hell's inhabitants will spend an eternity in tortuous agony because all their lives they looked into that mirror, that perfect law of liberty, and they intended to do what was right, only to walk away and do nothing. We don't want to be hearers only. As James admonishes us, we should be hearers and doers of the word of God. James 1.25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. A pure religion begins, it is the foundation, or the foundation of pure religion is in doing and continuing to do the will of God. You know, many things are said, many blessings are uttered through the New Testament towards those that not only hear, but do what they hear, the word of God. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So doers, as James says, are blessed. In Romans 2 verse 13, we find that it is the doers of the law that are justified. And we find in Matthew 7 and 21 that it is not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, that will enter the kingdom of heaven, but it is the ones who do the will of the Father that are allowed a place in the kingdom. Yes, we must be doers of the word of God. Now, you might say, what is it that we do? Well, we do what we find in this great book. We do what we find in the word of God. We live a life of obedience. We obey our Lord. In John 14 and 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That means that we obey God 
in what he tells us to do for salvation. We believe, as we're told in John 3 and 18. We repent of our lives of sin, as we've already read from Luke 13 and 3. We confess Christ, as we find in Matthew 10, verse 32. And we are baptized for the remission of our sins, as Jesus commanded in Mark 16 and verse 16. Our obedience doesn't stop there, however. We continue to do the will of the Lord. We continue to follow his word in terms of our worship. We continue to obey him in terms of our lifestyle and our morality. And we strive to live righteously because he has required it and because he has commanded it. There are also good things that we need to do, good works that we should accomplish. James said in James 2 and 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. John would say in 1 John 1 or 1 John 3 and 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. If we want to be righteous, we must be doing what God has declared. We must be practicing the righteousness that he lays forth in his word. We work by keeping ourselves pure. We work by keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. We work by serving and helping others in need. We work by studying God's word. We work by teaching it to those that are lost. We work by dedicating every single day of our life to serving our creator. True religion, religion that is pure and undefiled, is not coming to services a few times a week. True religion is not saying that we are religious or merely telling others that we are followers of Christ. True religion is not intending to do what God's word commands us to do. Pure religion, on the contrary, is working for Christ, fulfilling the Lord's commands, doing the will of God. The first step to partake in pure and undefiled religion is to be not just a hearer, but a hearer and a doer. For anyone that would disagree or who might still be tempted to walk away from the mirror of God's word without doing what you know you need to do, let's see what Jesus has to say about hearers and doers. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 27, the Lord said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. We see very plainly from the teaching of Jesus, those that hear the words and do nothing will come to complete and utter ruin. He likens such an individual to a man that foolishly builds his house on the sand. Maybe it has a beautiful view. Maybe it has an oceanfront view that is absolutely spectacular, but there is no foundation. Maybe the intentions are wonderful. The intentions are great, but there is no foundation in doing. Jesus says such a man, when the storms come, when the rains fall, when the winds blow, and they beat against that house because there is no foundation, he says that the house will fall and its fall will be great. Those that hear the words of the Lord and do nothing, they might be filled with great intentions. They might hear wonderful words over and over again. But through the storms and the trials of life, through the temptations that come and go, that they give way to over and over because they don't do what God has said, there will come a great fall. The greatest fall that there could be, and that is eternal damnation. But for those that will do what Christ says, for those that will hear and gladly receive and then obey, Christ says, that man shall be like the one who built his house on a rock. There's a sure foundation. 
something that is steadfast that supports and holds the house so that when the winds blow as hard as they might, when the rain falls uh, as torrential as it could be, the house will still stand because that person is doing what Christ has called him to do. What will your eternal fate be? Will it be ruin or will it be salvation? Will it be utter ruin, not just monetary or physical or health, but eternal, soul-damning ruin? Or will you be immovable, steadfast, grounded and rooted in the grace of God by doing his word and obeying his will so that one day you will be granted an everlasting home with God, with his son, with the Holy Spirit and all the angels of heaven and the saints that have gone before and will yet to come. That can be your home. That can be your fate. If you will but have pure religion in your life, which can begin today by being not a hearer only, but a hearer and the doer of the will of God.